Looks like you got everybody. Yes, sir, Mayor. I believe I have everybody now as panelists. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. Members of the public can view this meeting live on channel eight or c3gov.com slash video. If you're a council member, a member of Adams 14 School District, please be sure to have your video camera on and be mindful that we are streaming this meeting on channel eight and on our city's website. The chat function has been disabled to ensure that the public can see all portions of the meeting. City clerk is the host of the meeting and I and I, our IT director will be the co-host for tonight's special meeting. Council members, members of Adams 14 and panel will be able to unmute themselves when they prevent disruptions. So at this time, we'll call the meeting to order. First on the agenda is an update from Commerce City on three different items. So I'll invite Deputy City Manager Tinkleberg to provide the update on 60th and Vasquez intersection improvement. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just give you a quick overview. Some time back, uh, we started working with CDOT, the Department of Transportation, regarding uh, possible improvements to Vasquez and 60th Avenue. Um, I'm sure all of you have been through that intersection a number, of <clears throat> excuse me, a number of times. And uh, the uh, regional director of CDOT calls it the worst intersection in the state, and uh, I believe him. So the proposed improvements are to address both uh, the operations of the uh, signal uh, at the intersection, improve the mo mobility and the safety in the intersection. Uh, CDOT wants to do these initial projects to uh, improve the operation in anticipation of the improvements to I-70, I-270, I'm sorry. Um, they have put that into their plan and uh, anticipate starting the environmental assessment on I-270. And so these projects are to uh, occur before that happens. And so uh, as part of that, they, they're evaluating the whole area and uh, really focused on two intersections. It's the 60th and Vasquez and also 62nd and Vasquez. The uh, preliminary estimate for near-term projects is about $22 million. Uh, funding so far identified is $12 million. So we have funding to do some of the near-term projects, but uh, not near all. And the next steps is uh, they are evaluating one more option. Um, they had a number of options that have been evaluated already. And uh, the mayor asked for a meeting with the CDOT executive director and and uh, I met with him, with her and a number of the CDOT staff out there to discuss uh, an additional option for throughput. And uh, so they're taking a look at that as well. And then following that, they will take the options out to uh, area businesses and the public for input. So uh, at that point, they'll screen the alternatives, uh, do cost estimates again, and then uh, start design once they've coordinated with uh, Commerce City and uh, the other funding partners. So that's that's a quick overview. I can answer any questions if you have more specific questions. Anybody have any questions regarding this item? Seeing no questions, thank you for the update, sir. Yes, sir. I will turn it over to Chief Nichols then to talk about the police department. Good morning. Oh, good evening. Sorry, it's been a relatively long day. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. And I've been asked to talk about uh, SB 20 2017, the law enforcement uh, integrity and accountability bill, accountability bill and how it will impact Commerce City Police Department specifically as it relates to our SRO program. Uh, as most of you are aware, this uh, new bill is uh, Colorado was one of the first in the nation to sort of address the uh, law enforcement accountability after the uh, incident that occurred in Minneapolis. Uh, and so the new bill offers quite a few new requirements. Uh, and I will just go through these briefly. I'm sure most of you have heard this, but I want to make sure that we cover it. Uh, officers can't use carotid choke holes. Uh, they use deadly force to arrest someone on suspicion of minor or nonviolent offenses. Uh, there must be proof of imminent threat of danger. Uh, 
Uh, one of the big changes is all police officers and sheriff deputies will be required to wear body worn cameras when they make stops and during most interactions with the public. This will more than certainly impact the uh, school district with regards to wearing body worn cameras in the schools and taking enforcement action. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, it will also require the release of that footage in most circumstances in 14 days. And again, we'll talk about the impact of that on the school district in just a little bit. Uh, it makes sure that officers can be sued individually for misconduct. Uh, one of the other things that's gonna have a big impact on the school district is cops must now have a legal basis for establishing contact with someone, um, which includes stopping them on the street, pulling over vehicles or potentially consensual or what we would have deemed consensual contacts, uh, particularly with students on school property is also going to be impacted. Uh, some other changes in 2023, uh, we're required to report all use of force that results in bodily injury or death. Uh, there was some other language related to protest, what we can and can't do. And then it also gave the attorney general the power to investigate police departments for civil rights violation. And so today I want to talk to you about how this is going to impact the uh, relationship that Commerce City has with uh, not only Adams 14, but 27J. Uh, as, you know, as you heard me mention, there are quite a, a few changes that the law sort of implements that will change the way we do policing here, not only in Commerce City, but throughout the state. Uh, what I am pleased to tell you is that a lot of the things that came through the new law, uh, Commerce City had been doing for quite some time, uh, due in part to our interactions with the Department of Justice and the program that we undertook two, two and a half years ago. Uh, so most of our policies were already uh, up to date and are in line with the things that are being called for in the bill. One of the things we're trying to make a determination about is the fiscal impact it's going to have to the police department. Uh, we've had body worn cameras uh, for almost four years now. We were one of the first in the state to do so. Uh, I can tell you the cost for digital storage is extremely expensive. Uh, and most of our unclaimed body-worn camera footage related to consensual contacts and vehicle stops, uh, for the most part, we save those for six months. Uh, the new law mandates that we keep everything for a minimum of two years. Uh, for those of you that are not digitally savvy, that's a lot of data that's going to be getting saved and it is going to be extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, but it is a mandate of the state. Uh, we're trying to figure out the best way to calculate what our last two years of data was. And, and if we were to keep all of that for two years, we're trying to calculate what the price of that is going to be. Uh, but I anticipate it's, it's, I'm gonna guess it's gonna be roughly about $1.5 million. That's a, gonna be a big piece of change that uh, Commerce City is going to be taxed to keep track of. Probably the issue that's going to impact the school district first is going to be, again, the body-worn cameras. Currently, our policy doesn't allow us to wear body-worn cameras in schools. The new law did not really address that issue. And so we are assuming on the conservative side that if we're going to be making uh, some sort of contact with a student. And the only way we can now do that is through uh, some sort of legal enforcement action, the camera will re be required to be on. Um, obviously students are juveniles and the release of that information can be relatively sensitive. Uh, my concern is a juvenile telling a police officer something of a sensitive nature, us having to capture that and then later releasing that in 14 days could cause some problems within the school. Uh, we are still working with our, um, our city attorney and our legal staff to determine the impact of that. Uh, Right now, we don't have a good answer for you, but we are working on it. And as soon as we do, we absolutely want to make sure that both school districts understand uh, what our position is and what our new requirements are so that you make decisions on our being in the schools. Uh, at least it is an informed decision. Because uh, I will tell you, as I sit here today, I err on the caution of privacy for students and making sure that we maintain good relations with students. And if that means that uh, police officers may be hampering our ability to maintain that privacy. I think this is something that this body needs to take a look at and make some uh, decisions regarding. Uh, I will also be the first one to tell you that I am extremely proud of our program. Uh, one of the things we had uh, 
brought to our attention when we did our work with the Department of Justice was just how top-notch our program is. Uh, it is not only so great that it's been at least attempted to be replicated in at least six other jurisdictions that we're aware of. Uh, so I, I, you know, I watch the same news stories you do about the pipeline of prison. I, we do not um, advocate for those types of programs. I'm proud of the work that our officers do, but we have a very thoughtful process when it comes to selecting SROs. Uh, the tendency for most agencies to put SROs is they grab the junior street cop and they go, you're now an SRO. Is, we don't do that in Commerce City. Uh, we take folks that want to be SROs. We train them accordingly before they step uh, foot into a school. So we're proud of our program, uh, but we understand that there's going to need to be a call for for change on the way we do business, and we're looking forward to working with the school district on that. Uh, the other issue that's going to be of primary concern to the school district is going to be the requirement that police have a legal basis for contacting someone. Um, oftentimes, police will check folks for duress to make sure they are okay, uh, just simply to make sure that they are in a great state of mind. Uh, this bill tends to change that a little bit. Uh, having a lawful basis for contacts means that welfare checks may be problematic. And again, I don't want to be too preemptive. This is an issue we're working with our city attorney and the DA's office on, uh, but the law is pretty clear with having a legal basis for contact. Uh, so randomly talking to students and staff in the school, um, I'm sure we can still do neighborly gestures, uh, but taking information will require the camera to come on and it will change the structure of contact with uh, police officers. Again, I wish I could provide some more details to you, but this is fairly new. Uh, we are in depth on a daily basis with our legal staff to determine how we're going to write our policies and implement our plan moving forward. Uh, I've done nothing but for the last three weeks, but take a look at this bill and try to determine how it's going to be implemented in Commerce City and then sharing that information with the folks that are gonna be, be impacted. And so on that note, um, I am available for questions if there are any. Anybody have any questions for the police chief at this time? Uh, chief Nichols, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Don Rangel, I'm uh, currently the acting superintendent. I think uh, one of the things that uh, um, we're going to need to be very systematic about is uh, um, partnering with the Commerce City Police Department to talk about um, what this new means um, and what will be allowable and not allowable in the school, where there's flexibility and where there's not flexibility. So I'm really looking forward to um, getting our folks uh, geared up to have these conversations with you and your team. Um, to, so that uh, um, so, so that it uh, goes well uh, for all involved, and, but especially our kids. So I look forward to that. Yes, sir. I tend to agree with you. And again, my my position on this, and and the city attorney would like to weigh in. And we want to be very conservative with our approach. Mm -hmm. I don't want to use a school as a testing ground for trying to skirt the issues that the new law is sort of implemented. Uh, so we're gonna be very conservative in our approach. Uh, and we will, again, my, my uh, direction to my staff is let somebody else test it first. <laughs> I don't want that, I don't want Commerce City to be a hashtag. So uh, we're gonna be very conservative. I anticipate it'll probably take us a, another 30 days before we can figure out how this is going to impact the schools. And what I plan on doing is making sure that all of our political entities understand and fully know what the new roles are, what we are going to be able to do, what we are not going to be able to do. And, and again, so that folks can make some educated decisions about the SRO program moving forward. Uh, we understand it can be a lightning rod for debate. Um, again, we certainly want to be great partners. And if that means that we need to take a step back, then absolutely we're willing to do that. Uh, at the end of the day, my concern is make sure our community stays safe, make sure our students have uh, the, the best possible educational experience that they can, and I have a responsibility to keep my staff safe as well. So as long as I think we can keep those three priority, priorities in line, I think we'll be okay. But thank you for your comments, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you. 
Councilwoman Smith, you have some questions? Hey, Chief Nichols, as far as releasing the body cam footage, will there be any exceptions for that or is everything gonna be done or released? Uh, you know what, that's probably a better question for the city attorney. I certainly don't wanna give legal advice. Uh, the law is pretty clear about 14 days with the exception of certain circumstances, but it does not define what those circumstances are. Uh, and I will tell you that's probably going to be debated for quite some time. Uh, so if the city attorney is on the line, I think he's probably in a better position to answer that question for you. I am on the line. I apologize for not having a camera available, but um, council member Smith, there, there are exceptions in the bill. And as the chief mentioned, it's unclear exactly what they are. Um, those exceptions largely go to privacy interests and somewhat define privacy um, where there's a substantial privacy interest implicated. Uh, and they define that um, as far as personal identifying information, um, interiors of home in some cases, um, particularly egregious scenes um, and the, the manner of the incident recorded um, are specifically listed. It's gonna take some time to figure out what those exceptions are and how that interplays with the current open records laws, including the Criminal Justice Records Act. Um, this was written not in mind of what laws already exist. So the rush to get this bill done um, made for some very, very confusing implications for the release of body cam footage. However, body cam footage release is governed under a section that doesn't become effective for a few more years. So we should have time to figure that out and we're going to continue to operate under the current uh, criminal justice records act standards for the release of, of records including video that was the end of my comment thank you thank you any other questions for the chief Seeing none, we'll move on to the next topic. Thank you, Chief, for your time this evening. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Tinklenberg, you're gonna provide an update on COVID-19? Yes, sir. So uh, back on, I think it was March 12 or 13, we uh, closed down all our city facilities and uh, sent staff home to start working remotely. And uh, thankfully we had enough uh, laptop computers to uh, to provide people who had just have desktop units with uh, laptops or iPads and uh, everyone started proceeding to work from home or uh, work remotely at least. Um, since then, uh, you know, the whole country shut down for a while basically and uh, we've seen a signif significant drop off in revenue, which uh, is not surprising given that businesses had to close as well. And so uh, the early estimate that we received from our finance department was that we would see a, a drop in revenue somewhere between 10 and $25 million. That's out of uh, 95.7 million in the general fund. So you, you know, you're looking at about a 10 to 25% drop in revenue uh, at that point. So we proceeded to go through our budget and cut expenditures by 10 million and uh, had backup plans for an additional 15 million if that was necessary. Now, thankfully, uh, we've received an updated estimate and it looks like the reduction in revenue is gonna be in the neighborhood of $8 million. So that's well within our uh, cuts to the budget. But again, you know, if there's a second wave and businesses have to close down again, there there's going to be an impact on revenues, obviously. So, uh, again, we, we have additional steps that we can take in case uh, the worst case the uh, worst case comes about. But uh, we we have uh, staff still working remotely as many as uh, possibly can. We do bring in some staff members on a rotating basis into the civic center. Uh, we did open the Civic Center June 10, I believe it was, uh, but it's by appointment only. And uh, we also opened the recreation centers on June 15, but again, by appointment only and for uh, specific classes where attendance is limited. So uh, we're feeling our way, trying to uh, conservatively, you know, reopen what we can. But again, we want to ensure safety for the public 
as well as for the staff and, and the participants. Now, we have seen a gradual decline in COVID-19 cases in Commerce City, but uh, there still are active cases happening. And so, you know, it would be relatively easy to see a flare up happen. And again, that's why we're trying to be as careful as possible. Any questions on that? Thank you Any much. Any questions at this time? Seeing no questions, we will move on. Uh, Madam Sportine, at this time, would like to turn the meeting over to you guys to provide updates on your agenda items. Great, thank you. I had to figure out how to do that unmute. So, um, again, uh, we really appreciate the time and we appreciate um, the opportunity we have when we get together with, um, with our city council. And uh, because we do share a community and, uh, and so our work um, coincides very closely with yours. Um, just as far as district updates, I'm gonna be pretty brief, but it, uh, as we were just discussing, it seems like uh, this school year was the tale of two school years. We had our school year up until about March 12th. And then we had our school year after March 12th when we um, had to very quickly very quickly a move from being uh, um, educating our kids in person to educating our kids at home. And in that process, I was very pleased and proud of the Adams 14 staff um, that really thought through how it was that we were going to continue to feed our, our children and our families during that time period, how we were gonna get technology from Chromebooks to um, hotspots into the hands of our families to make sure that everybody would be able to access the home learning. And um, we were able to um, actually pull off a very successful um, drive-through graduation for our students that our families got to fully participate in. And so um, it is, uh, it was a, a lot of pride that I uh, take. And, and I will tell you, we have a school board that, uh, asks really thorough questions. And, uh, and that has been a, a, a plus because they, they, are, they study, they pay attention to the details. And so when they were elected in November and then we were able to bring uh, Director Zubia on in February, um, the board is uh, clicking on all cylinders and they're gonna continue um, to be um, just an extraordinary board um, working into the future. I do want to say that uh, our original goal um, in this um, in this venture when MGT was hired was is to work with the school district in partnership to move them from being a school district that was accredited um, with priority improvement to move them into a fully accredited school district. Um, uh, um, and to move our schools from being um, in turnaround or priority improvement and um, an improvement to being schools that were performance level. Um, that goal has not changed. Um, the district is gonna continue to work towards moving and changing the status of the school district. And uh, unfortunately with COVID-19, state testing did not occur. So it's hard for us to get that measure. But the important work of educating our kids in a way um, that allow them to move forward and progress the way we would want to will continue even in an at-home setting, and that's, an, and that's gonna be important for us. Um, we have gone through and worked to um, organize our, um, our district office and the leadership there in a different way to best provide support and guidance to our schools so that they can become the kind of schools they need to be, and that work is done. And so um, our goals are gonna stay the same. We're gonna continue to um, focus on uh, those things that help our schools move um, on the um, state performance frameworks. But more importantly, um, we're gonna continue to pay attention to those areas that we need to continue to improve, such as in the area of continuing to build trust, um, better communication with our community and our stakeholders, and, and finding those avenues for our stakeholders to be able to engage meaningfully with the school district in order to influence um, the kind of school district we have down the road. And so I'm proud of our team it's been a joy to work with our new school board. 
um, with that, um, I would like to move forward and have um, us give you a, a little snapshot of school in August and school opening in the fall and what we are currently thinking in regards to um, educating our kids once it's time for them to return. I'm going to turn that over to our Chief Academic Affairs Officer, Sheila Burke, to give that update. Thank you, Superintendent Rangel. Um, good evening, Mayor, City Council members, and community members. Uh, as Mr. Rangel said, my name is Sheila Burke, and currently I serve as the Executive Director of Federal Programs, Intervention Services, Technology, and Schools. And as we move into the 2021 school year, I'll serve as the Chief Academic Affairs Officer for our district. I'm here tonight to provide you with an update on our Fall 2021 Restart Reopening Draft Plan. I do have a presentation for you uh, that consists of about seven slides. So I didn't know if you wanted to post it at this time or if you just wanted me to read through what I have currently. Sheila, I, uh, this is the city clerk, Dylan Gibson. I can pull that up if you want me to go through it and you can just tell me when the next slide is. Please, if you wouldn't mind, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Yep, I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, a team of our Adams 14 colleagues and I have been uh, meeting over the course of six weeks to begin our draft plan of what the fall could look like in Adams 14. Our team was made up of 35 colleagues that served as classroom teachers, special educators, school leaders, our CTA members, department leads, and directors. We went, met every Monday for two hours to review guidance from our medical professionals, state professionals, and from the Colorado Department of Education. We also spent time viewing draft plans from neighboring metro area districts. If you'll advance the slide, please. Our team used this information to co-create a draft plan for Adams 14 that you will see tonight listed in three options for our district. I'm sorry, if you'll go back one slide, thank you. Um, the three options I'm going to present to you tonight as a draft plan for Adams 14 are a traditional hybrid or a home learning option. You may refer to this option um, and other districts as remote learning. On the screen, you will see a description of what each of those options consists of. In our traditional option, learning will occur in a traditional classroom setting with accommodations for social distancing, disinfecting, and monitoring of COVID-19 symptoms. In our hybrid model, um, the in-person and home learning continues simultaneously by following guidelines and protocols set by our health and state professional. Teachers would continue to instruct at our schools with a percent of students participating in in-person learning and the other percent of students would complete their learning at home using our online platform. This option may be considered if we need to help to slow the spread of COVID-19 by social distancing or gradually reopening school settings due to an increase in community or state COVID-19 cases. And then finally, we have our home learning or what you also may refer to as remote. This is where learning occurs at home with instruction and support provided by our Adams 14 teachers. This option may be considered if we have a positive confirmed student or staff case and school or district has been advised to temporarily close for the recommended number of days, or if our state health orders us to move into a stay at home or a safer at home order. Through our weekly planning meetings, we explored several options and determined that the three you see on your screen meet the needs of our community best and represent our best thinking with the current medical and state guidance. At any time, we will be prepared as an organization to move through each of these options should we need to or be advised by our medical professionals to do so. There is still plenty of work to complete with each of these options and we will continue through our, through our June and July months. We will update our plan as new guidance is provided and or released. You will be able to find our draft plan on our district website at www.adams14.org. Next slide, please. 
Our academic leadership team hosted three focus groups with students, parents, and teachers the week of June 15th. You'll see that information on the left side of your screen. We met with our high school students from Adams City High School and Lester Arnold, and they participated in our student focus group. They indicated that we, they would like to return to in-person learning, have clear instructions on assignments for home learning, as well as have more of a structured day during home learning. Finally, our students asked for consistent use of our Infinite Campus portal, as well as our Google Classroom to check grades and assignments. We also met with our families and our parent focus groups from preschool through high school. During our time with our families, they are requesting regular communication on our draft plan and would like to meet more frequently as a focus group to receive updates and provide input and are asking for training for our school staff on COVID-19 safety and to have our online option be more engaging as well as a helpline to assist our parents. We also met with um, our staff members during our teacher focus group. Our teachers provided strong questions for our academic team to consider and to respond to around logistics, lesson planning, responding to system, symptoms, training, support, and safety. While we don't have all the responses just yet for all those questions, uh, we're working with our district leaders, medical professionals, and state officials in our neighboring districts to help answer those questions. In addition to the focus group, we provided a survey to our students and families the week of June 1st. Uh, you'll see that information on the right side of your screen. We asked 12 questions to our parents and 13 questions to our students. When we asked our community if students should return to in-person learning, um, you'll see the percentages listed there under number two. And then finally, we asked around um, a allowing our students to return to in-person learning if our parents felt that it was safe and 69% said yes. And finally, the question you'll see on your screen there is um, we asked if our students and parents would like to participate in online learning for the entire 2021 school year. And we had 62% of our responses indicated that our students and families are not supportive of home learning for the entire 2021 school year. Our 2021 planning team and our academic team are using this information from the focus groups and our survey responses to help strengthen our draft plan. Next slide, please. In response to our focus groups and surveys, we are considering adding a new program as a response to COVID-19 called Adams 14 Online. This program will be offered to students and families that really enjoyed online learning and would like to continue that for the 2021 school year or for students and families that may have a greater reservation despite all our efforts around safety measures about returning in the fall to a traditional in-person learning environment. Adams 14 would consist of a full functioning program that provides aligned and accredited online content for participating students in core subjects such as English language arts, math, science, and social studies, and provides aligned and accredited content for electives. While the planning for our new Adams 14 online program is still in the early stages, we are considering a few options. One option is a kinder through 12th grade program. The other option is a sixth through 12th grade program. We are also considering doing this internally as well as with an external partner. Our fall restart district webpage has an interest form for students and families to complete regarding this potential new program for our district. And we are using the interest form to determine next steps as well as resource allocation. Next slide, please. As our team also responded to the community and staff feedback, we have purchased a one-year subscription to Rethink as a social emotional learning curricula for our district. This program is aligned to the four competencies supported by the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, or what we refer to as CASEL. It's a framework for our students to be able to enhance the capacity to integrate skills, attitudes, and behaviors to deal effectively and ethically with daily tasks and challenges through a rubric of the five competencies. The Rethink program is an online platform that includes online lessons for students, a parent portal available to track student progress, tier one, two, and three resources for mental health providers to use with students, 
professional development modules for teachers and principal materials for teachers. Teachers will receive training on this new curricula as part of the, as part of the fall professional development from the district. Next slide. Our team frequently checks the resource page for schools and districts regarding COVID-19 on the Colorado Department of Education or CDE's website for guidance, updates, and tools. CDE has organized their resources using a legend that you see on your screen, indicating a red check mark for items that are required by schools and districts, a blue star or snowflake to indicate guidance, and a light bulb indicating some of the school and district something that the school or district should consider. CDE's website also provides guidance around health and safety, parents, communication, educators, schools, and districts, to name a few. In addition to the guidance, CDE also provides key updates, a toolkit along with webinars our team has been participating in, and checklists we are using to help with our plan development. Next slide. In closing, I'm proud of the work our team has completed this far. We still have a lot of plans to continue with. Our fall restart reopening options for Adams 14 are a traditional, hybrid, and a home learning option. With the current guidance and research around instruction, my recommendation to Mr. Ringel, our acting superintendent, is to begin our school year in a traditional option where learning occurs in a traditional classroom setting with accommodations for social distancing disinfecting, and the monitoring of symptoms. I would like to leave you with just a few of the next steps our Adams 14 colleagues are working on. Next slide. We're gonna continue to work on uh, with finance and purchasing of safety materials and technology for students and staff, work with local medical professionals on plans for responding to and managing symptoms, continue meeting with our focus groups and our 2021 planning team in July for feedback and providing a second survey the week of July 6. Uh, vi video tutorials for students, parents, and staff, and working with our human resources department on staff considerations following the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA. We will continue to view guidance from health and state officials and aligning our curricular resources and professional development for each fall start option. We are also working with transportation on a plan for a traditional and our hybrid option. Our plan has come a long way and there's still a lot of left to be done to ensure that we are ready for our staff to return on August 3rd and for our students to return on August 10th. You will be able to view our fall restart reopening plan on our district website, again at www.adams14.org. I want to thank you for your time tonight, and I'd like to thank our Adams 14 school and district colleagues that have helped to co-create our fall restart reopening plan. Please let me know if you have any questions, and Superintendent Rangel, this concludes my update on our fall restart reopening plan. Thank you. Is there any questions for Sheila? Councilwoman Noble. Thank you for your report. And um, I can't imagine what you're all having to go through. It has to be incredibly challenging. So appreciate you being here. I'm curious what the challenges were when you um, had all the computers go out in terms of everyone having Wi-Fi in order to use them. Were there um, any students who weren't able to use laptops at home because they didn't have uh, Wi-Fi or access to Wi-Fi at their homes? Yeah, so thank you, council member, for the question. We did have students that did not have access to um, a wireless connectivity. And so what we did is partnered with uh, an industry called Khajiit Modems and we purchased them for the district, which allowed um, wireless hotspots for our students that needed those uh, in their homes at the district would pay each of those services for the families. Uh, that is something that we are also doing as we go into the fall for 2021 school year. In addition, we've also partnered with Comcast 
and they're to pay six month subscriptions for our families and students that need that service. And how will you decide who, so you're going, it sounds like you're going to start with everyone on traditional learning. Is that correct? Was that that's, your conclusion? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Other questions? Um, the last thing I'll say about that is that uh, with social emotional learning, just a reminder that our children will have been um, away from an in-school setting for four to five months. And uh, I think sometimes uh, um, we have to be attentive to the fact that uh, um, um, life is uh, not equitable across all of our kids. And uh, so we want to make sure that we are um, being real attentive to their needs as they begin to re-enter. And then of course, it's a, a landscape that seems to be changing with states having COVID cases on the rise in several places. And we're gonna to need to be paying attention to that and hence really being prepared with all three options um, if need be. And so that's where we're at with that. Other questions? Before I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you all for the presentations. Um, really interesting information. And um, I was just curious how you feel the success of the home learning um, for the spring the spring period of time went. Do you feel like students will come back prepared to jump in um, right on level? Or do you think there will be a little bit of a catch up to um, bring students uh, up to where they need to be? I think that uh, um, we had kids engage as much as we possibly could. But I also think that there is some learning loss that has occurred. And typically, we have some learning loss that occurs over the summer months anyway. And then we've added a bit to that. And so us being able to assess where our children are at um, and our students are at um, very thoroughly in the fall to determine um, where, they're, where, where all of them are at and if there has been a loss of learning and where we need to accelerate, engage and intervene um, to make it stronger. Because we're gonna, in some cases, we're gonna have to play catch up and that's just a fact. It's a great question. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. I think we'll move forward. Um, instead of uh, putting up um, uh, any pictures around our board goals, let me just say this, is that our school board has engaged in many, many hours of retreat time, talking about what it is that our school district wants to be about in the future. What is it that we would want to be true for our school district as we move down the road? And our board, um, made up of our four, member, our four members before we added um, um, board member Zubia in February, really started to establish some goals that we're gonna continue to try to refine because we wanna make sure that all five board members or influence uh, is on the goals that we have. And you know, right now, we really want all of our students to graduate college and or career ready. And for our kids to be competitive um, with the world around them, they really need to be able to grad, we need to graduate um, 90% plus of our students, we'd like to graduate them all. And that's not where we're currently at. And so we want them to graduate college or career ready. And we want them to really have a diploma plus. So they graduate with a high school diploma plus something else. They may graduate with a diploma plus a seal of biliteracy, a diploma um, plus potentially an associate's degree, a diploma plus um, an industry certification of some sort, because that's what's gonna allow them to be competitive. Um, our board wants to be able to recruit, hire, and develop, recruit, hire, develop, and retain highly qualified staff. And, um, and part of that recruitment is, is in being able to be aggressive um, in the market to say, Adams 14 is the place to be, and this is the place where you want to come work. And then we need to also develop our staff and create the kind of working conditions that have our staff stay with us. Um, our board is really interested in having Adams 14 be a source of community pride that has a reputation for excellence. There's an old saying that reputation is what people think you are and um, character is what you are. We're really working on the character of our school district because then the reputation is going to follow as our data begins to improve. 
And then we really need to go after um, obtaining the financial resources, not just to improve student achievement, but also the learning environments in which they are living. Our buildings are old and they're, worn, and they're wearing out and our deferred maintenance is extraordinary. And so at some point being able to have the trust of our community, having the trust of our community to say, you know what, um, Adams 14 is the district that we want to invest in um, so that we can improve um, the schools that our children walk through and um, can create those 21st century learning environments. And so our board is very focused on that, but those, these goals are gonna be a living goals. We're gonna refine them as we go along the way but they have given us some needed guidance so that we have um, our strategic planning can go forward and we can start to work towards putting those things in place that help us achieve those. And so um, any questions about our goals at all? All right. Councilwoman Allen Thomas. Yes, thank you for the presentations tonight. I appreciate that as well. I did just have one question because I didn't hear it mentioned, but um, does Adams 14 plan on applying for any bonds? So at some point, um, I guess the question is, is at some point, will the school district uh, uh, need to be in a position um, to go to the voters of our community around a bond issue. Is that your question? Yes, correct. And I, and I believe that that's going to be the case. At, at some point, we're going to need to go to our voters. Um, but we want to make sure that uh, um, our school district is making adequate progress in regards to our academics. And we want to make sure that um, it is becoming the kind of district in which we have a trusting relationship with our community. And that's, con that, that's going to take some continued work because people typically um, are more likely um, to invest if they believe in the school system and how it's working. And so at some point, we're gonna have to have that conversation, but just not yet. Okay, all right, thank you. And finally, I guess our last agenda item is going to be, um, we're gonna have Eddie Stores, Edward Stores, who's uh, gonna be serving as our Executive Director of Budget and Finance and, and um, who's going to give a 30,000 foot view of uh, our budget. Um, and just like the city, um, COVID-19 COVID and the impact on our economy has impacted us as well. And so our, our school board was in the tough position, um, just as you are as city council folks, to be able to adopt a budget that allows us to live with our means and, and, and our resources are going to be shrinking. So um, Mr. Storrs, would you uh, walk them through? Thanks, Superintendent Ringel. Um, I did have a presentation, if, if we can pull that up and uh, go ahead and display that. Thank you. Good evening, distinguished board members, board presidents, council members, and mayor. My name is Edward Stores, and I'm the executive director of budget and finance for Adams County School District 14. Tonight, I'll share with you a brief overview of our initial budget for the 2021 school year. As explained by Ms. Burke, we've been quickly preparing for three different scenarios possible for the fall learning, and I'll discuss how that's currently integrated with our 2021 budget. Next slide, please. A focus this spring in our budget development has been understanding the impact of COVID-19 on our funding from the state, which we receive as per pupil revenue. Our adopted budget includes a reduction to this funding of approximately 3.4 million for 2021. We also have budget for reduction in declining or declining enrollment of approximately 1.7 million for a total reduction of 5 million or 8.3%. Next slide, please. No, I'm sorry, next slide. Thank you. The district has seen declining enrollment for the last several years and, pro and projects this to continue at least short term. The per pupil revenue we receive is based on a five year uh, average of our pupil FTE, which we refer, refer to as the funded FTE, which helps make our funding more predictable and minimizes the impact of sudden drops in enrollment. Using the five year average also means we can predict with more certainty that at least our funded FTE will continue to drop for the next few years. 
Here you see the projected drop in the funded FTE from 6,674 in 2021 to 6,096 in 22, 23. Next slide, please. Our general fund beginning balance uh, will be slightly higher than it may have otherwise been due to COVID as we saw some budgets, for example, substitute costs go unspent at year end and uh, unexpected costs related to COVID are expected to pick, be picked up by grants. In the general fund, some of these unexpected costs include paying staff hazard pay, providing internet access for remote learning and distributing Chromebooks for remote learning. In our nutrition fund, we saw loss of revenue as students weren't being fed in the traditional school setting and instead we implemented a feeding program to provide meal distribution for our community. Next slide, please. At the end of the coming fiscal year, we project an ending spendable fund balance of approximately 6.6 .6 million. The next slide will look at the out year, which will become clearer as our use of CARES Act funds becomes clearer. Guidance from CDE was just released and we anticipate bringing back an amended budget to reflect our finalized plan. Next slide, please. Based on state projections, we're projecting the 21-22 year to include an additional reduction of approximately 8% in our revenue. Using any proceeds from the sale, potential sale of ALSIP to offset the needed transfers, I'm sorry, that the land that ALSIP is uh, currently on, the old ALSIP, um, to offset the needed transfer to cap, to cap reserve for the next two years um, would keep us with a positive undesignated fund balance in year two. And so you can see in that first column projected 21, 22 and undesignated uh, ending fund balance of 825,000. Next slide, please. For our 2021 um, capital reserve budget we feel upgrading our phone and PA system are critical safety issues and have budgeted those. We're evaluating the extent CRF or CARES Act, a portion of the CARES Act funds can assist with these items. Among other things we've also budgeted for is an expansion to the camp parking lot to meet a city order. Next slide, please. Here are highlights from some of our major grant awards. Um, there's more detailed information in our budget document. We'd like to specifically note that approximately 650,000 of the CRF funds are from Adams County, um, for which we are very appreciative. The CRF and ESSER funds are uh, CARES Act funds and they're intended to assist us with co um, COVID related expenses and the SAFER grant is a uh, grant award we just received for radios. Next slide, please. We're preparing multiple scenarios for the fall and once this plan is finalized, we'll, uh, as I mentioned before, need to amend our budget to accurately account for it. And we'll just go ahead and go through some uh, examples in the, next, in the next slide that show um, how you can spend that uh, CARES Act funds. And that's kind of the piece of the puzzle we need to work our way through. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So I don't know if I'm gonna read all of these, but some of the things that you can spend this CARES Act money on um, specifically, the, the CRF money is a little bit more uh, restrictive is professional development, PP and E equipment for staff and students, um, student family engagement, sanitation supplies, uh, a COVID response team to help the district uh, respond when we, when we have any kind of an issue arise. Compensatory services for our special needs students, um, online partnerships, student devices, staff devices, and internet for students. Next slide, please. Um, there's kind of an assortment of IT costs, unemployment insurance. Um, we can increase instructional time to try to recover lost learning. We can implement academic intervention programs. Um, and then of course, just covering the online course development curriculum, as well as mental health for students related to COVID. Um, 
and then specific support for students who are homeless or have an IEP or are English language learners. <clears throat> and then um, any costs that were staff that are just repurposed to respond to COVID are also possible options. Um, and, and we are going to provide uh, an online option for families likely um, even if we fully open. Next slide, please. So that does conclude my presentation. I'm welcome to uh, answer any questions you may have. Councilman Wadiola. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I have a question. I know we, uh, when MGT came in, we have to pay them, what is it, total of 8.3 million or some sort of that. I could have the number wrong. Is MGT going to give the district a break or a discount since everybody's budget is, uh, you know, going to be a shortfall or how is that working and where's that money coming from? I think since it's taxpayer money, that's uh, important to put on the slideshow or let a lot of the community members know what the deal is with that. Thanks for the question, uh, Council Member Oriola. <clears throat> We do pay for uh, MGT out of our general fund as well as from uh, an easy grant. Um, so, so yeah, that is within our expense budget that you're seeing presented here. Um, and I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but um, that 2021 um, impact to the general fund is somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 million. Um, I, I don't think that we have finalized discussions with MGT that would, would directly answer your question. So I don't think I can really um, provide any answer to that piece of your your question. Well, I guess that's my uh, question to the elected officials. Is there talks to have with MGT since you guys will have a shortfall, we're having a shortfall. Um, hopefully MGT as being a good corporate partner would understand to maybe reduce the amount of money they're gonna have or is that something that's in the works? Um, I'll speak. Um, we have not had um, conversations regarding that. That would also be um, probably something that we would need to speak with the state board on as well. So we have not had conversations on that at this time. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Councilwoman Ellen Thomas. Yes, thank you. I want to ask a few questions too. Um, due to the COVID-19, how many teachers um, did Adams 14 lose? And um, how are the students who missed out like on time off from learning that fell back? Um, how are they gonna be caught up, um, you know, for the school year and the, so, those are my two first two questions. Um, Council member Alan Thomas, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I would just try and answer the first part and maybe turn over the second part to uh, Ms. Burke. Um, uh, you know, as far as the reductions to teachers related to COVID, I, I don't think that we, we had any, um, any changes I think that we had there were related to the declining enrollment we're seeing in the district. Thank you, Council Member, for the question. So the way that we're responding to uh, the learning loss that we had in the spring is that we've adjusted our curriculum design work, which includes our curriculum maps and pacing guides that our teachers use, as well as the units. So we did a lot of that work the week of June 1st through the 4th, and we'll continue to do that through the summer to focus on the standards that we typically teach in the spring and adding and incorporating that work into the fall when our students return, as well as the standards that they would typically be taught in this fall for the, um, the Colorado Academic Standard. And so we're going to adjust our pacing guides, our curriculum maps, and our unit plans to be able to adjust for that so that we can strengthen any learning loss that has occurred um, and continue that going forward into the next school year so that our students are reading and performing at or above grade level. Okay. Thank you. And then one, just one last question to where they, 
was the ongoing learning and was it offered also bilingual as well? That's correct. So um, any learning that we did in the spring uh, also was in um, all of our programs, both for our biliteracy or bilingual programs was done in both languages. And then we had our online versions of those. Through our summer programs, we focused and prioritized our high school students and we're offering two sessions this year. Um, and then we did uh, summer resources for all of our students in grades K through eight. Uh, for their parents and we have that on our website uh, for them as well. So we'll be moving into our second session of our um, summer program for our high school students, which begins in July. Okay, all right, thank you. Councilwoman Smith. Thank you guys for the presentation. As far as um, the laptops and stuff that you're providing for the kids, are they able to keep that? So, so the kids that are going to college concurrently with like high school, are they able to keep those after they graduate or do they have to give them back? So thank you council member for the question. So um, our current practice going into the 2021 school year will allow for our graduating seniors to keep their devices as they move into their college career or workforce readiness. Currently for the close of this school year, that was not one of the practices we had. We are also short devices across our system. And so we're working with the ESSER and COVID funds that Mr. Storrs just presented to you and with our um, board members to be able to look at purchasing more devices for our district so that we're ready for the fall, uh, including um, us moving to one-to-one -one with Chromebooks in grades three through 12 uh, and we're adding second grade now. And then for iPads and grades preschool through first grade, we are prioritizing our high school students and working our way backwards through the system with devices as we receive them uh, so that they will then travel with their devices to school and then again at home for their purposes. And that will be our practice going forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Council Member Smith, I, I would also like to add that our um, Adams 14 Education Foundation has assisted some of our graduating seniors with securing laptops as well to support their college education. That's awesome. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, please proceed, Mr. Bengal. So um, I we again, um, that is our presentation for tonight. I think our goal moving forward is going to be as, uh, to be as transparent as we possibly can, um, not just with our city council, but with our community. Um, I think it's going to be through transparency and a lot and sharing a lot of a lot of information um, that we can start to build some common understanding about the, the goals and tasks moving forward, not just for the school district, but also for our community. And so we really appreciate. Um, the opportunity to be able to uh, have this joint meeting with you. President Lewis, is there anything you would like to add? No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity for having this meeting and um, getting to know you at least um, in a virtual space. Uh, hopefully soon um, we can get to know each other more um, in, a, in a space where we can greet each other and, and actually face everybody. So want to thank everybody for your time. Thank you. Okay, I would also like to thank everybody from Adams 14 for being here this evening. Um, definitely look forward to September. Hopefully we can have an in-person meeting and actually uh, I agree. have a great dialogue about improving the relationship between our two entities and working together in partnership for our community. Mm. Did my other board members want to add anything? Um, I, I too would just like to um, echo uh, President Lewis's comments. I really appreciate this opportunity to 
meet you guys and see you guys face to face virtually. Um, I am uh, the Adams 14 and uh, city council liaison. So I will send you guys an email just so you have my contact information. Um, I have tried my best to uh, watch you guys online. It's a little weird right now because right when I was able to start attending the meetings, we all went to online. So um, just wanna thank you all for the opportunity and um, look forward to working with you. Sorry, this is Maria. Um, I too echo what uh, our uh, chair and vice chair has said. Um, but I also would like to, I know I, I'm a little bit different because I, I can't see everybody's name and I know there's quite a few uh, council members on here that are new. Well, there's a few of you and um, we really didn't do introductions, but maybe next time we could get um, an opportunity to do that. And then, um, you know, just know that we're here and we'd love to collaborate the more we can talk with each other, um, like the mayor said, so that we can have, uh, we can start building up our community a little bit better. So please let us know if there's something that um, we can do or, or if there's something that you would like to do to help, uh, let us know, just reach out. Thank you. Thank you guys. I think that's all on our part. Any council members wishing to speak? Thank you, ma'am. Any council members want to have anything to say? I have, uh... Okay, seeing none, um, I guess that will conclude our joint meeting with Adams 14 School District and the City Council. Once Again, we'd like to thank everybody for your time. Hope members of the public were able to view this and uh, get something out of it, especially the draft reopening plan. I greatly appreciate you guys sharing that with us. And, and uh, we'll be encouraging the community to um, reach out and try to find this video so that they can see what you guys have put together for them. So thank you for all that. Thank you guys, good night. Um, at this time we will adjourn and go into our special city council meeting. I have a couple minutes for the district to leave if you guys don't wish to be part of this meeting. <clears throat> Council, why don't we take uh, about a 10 minute bio break. So we'll be back at 720. And this meeting is in the same place. So no need to start up a different meeting.
right, we have everybody back. Looks like uh, we have one more. Two, two more. <laughs> All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, call the meeting to order. Will the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Madera. Present. Council Member Alan Thomas. Present. Council Member Noble. Present. <laughs> Council Member Wardiola. Present. Council Member Hurst. Present. Council Member Grimes. Present. Council Member Smith. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Frank. Present. Mayor Huseman. Present. Mr. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you. For the record, everybody is here. Um, purpose of this evening's meeting is for an executive session. And for a motion in a second to enter into the executive session. Council Member Grimes. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to enter into executive session um, pursuant to CRS 24-6-4024E for the purpose of determining and developing negotiating positions and instructing negotiators relative to an interim city manager agreement. A motion. Then we're in your executive session, Councilwoman Alan Thomas. I second the motion. Thank you. I have a motion and a second entering into executive session pursuant to CRS 24-6-402 parentheses four parentheses E for the purpose of determining and developing to an interim city manager for agreement. Is there any discussion on the item? Seeing a request for discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Council Member Madera? Yes. Council Member Alan Thomas? Yes. Council Member Noble? Yes. Council Member Wardiola? Yes. Council Member Hurst? Yes. Council Member Grimes? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Frank? Yes. Mayor Huseman? Yes. Passes unanimously, nine to zero. Great. The uh, city attorney has already emailed out a link for the executive session. We will now move to that meeting and return to this meeting after the executive session has followed, uh, finished. See you there in a couple minutes. <laughs> 